So I came of age in the, in the late 60s. Society was in turmoil. The Vietnam War was going on. A lot of people were dropping out in whatever capacity that was. And I had kind of those inclinations too. Not fulfilling a conventional role within society, whatever that might have been to me. I think I sort of fantasized myself going off and, and being in the woods somewhere and making things. When I left college, I felt like I wanted to do something with my hands. But there's something about wood that, that excites my passion, and I think it's because it's an organic material and it's always different. It's both constructive, you're joining pieces of wood together, and it's subtractive, where, you, where you're removing material to finally get at the form you want. In school, I studied architecture, and so furniture design isn't too terribly far removed from architecture. It's like architecture scaled down to a, a really human scale there that, that I liked. We sit on chairs, we sit at a table, and so that felt right to me as well, to make a, a useful object. We humans have a natural affinity to wood. We've been working with wood for tens of thousands of years. You know, we built our homes with it, we built boats, and I'm making paintings out of wood. My basic apprenticeship was with a man named Wendell Castle who did very interesting sculptural furniture. And I really admired the work that he was doing. I worked for him for a couple years, but I knew that I didn't want to just be a sort of poor copy of what he was doing, that I needed to do something different. So that's when I struck out doing marquetry. Marquetry has its origins in ancient Egypt. They cut up pieces of ivory and ebony and put it together in a geometric pattern to cover a furniture object, just gluing it onto that surface. And they're intricate and beautiful. They are also somewhat related to the idea of that royal furniture that came out of Europe 3,000 years later. It was meant to impress. If you're working with natural wood tones, it's kind of from beige to maybe black. So you have to work within those parameters of what the natural woods look like. I liken it to writing a sonnet where you're restricted to, you know, 14 lines and they have to be in iambic pentameter and it's the restrictions to it that in fact make it interesting for me. And this was the book that I learned from. It's by William A. Lincoln. It's an English book. Marquetry is actually like a jigsaw puzzle overlay. So it's thin pieces of wood veneer, generally wood, although sometimes other materials are used, but wood veneer that's pieced together like a jigsaw puzzle and then glued onto another surface. It's a challenge and, and a joy to be able to look at the individual piece of wood and say, how can I use this to best effect in my picture? I often add a lighter touch to the things and try to make something a little bit funny to amuse myself. I don't know if other people share my sense of humor, but if they do, so much the better. I was contacted by Lori Sanders of Historic Northampton, who said that they were having to cut down this tree on Main Street. She wondered if I'd be interested in any of the wood or if I knew anybody who would. Well, we had this venerable old sugar maple growing on historic Northampton's property right next to the Parsons house. And the tree was about 125 years old, but it had been suffering from decline for a long period of time. And after a large limb fell on one part of the house, we made the well, difficult decision to, to cut it down. 
but we didn't want to just cut it down and, and, and convert it into firewood. We wanted it to have another life. Initially, I wasn't interested at all, and then I found out that I have a ancestral connection with the family that lived in that historic Northampton house, and I thought it would be cool to make something out of it. Uh, but I work with fancy veneers for the most part, and so I'm looking for an interesting figure and grain pattern in the wood, and the places where you find that are around limbs, roots, crotches of the tree, where the wood has, has knotted itself up and compressed and done just some interesting things. Look at this part over here. You can even see in the raw, rough cut wood that there's something interesting going on. And it's because of that knot right there. You can see how the, the tree has compressed. There is an iconic piece of furniture called the Parsons Table that is super simple. It's just rectangular parts put together, and that's not what I do. Then I got the idea that maybe I can make this go in a spiral and put an ebony line around the spiral as the pieces got bigger and bigger as it got more and more to the outside. And for me, that said uh, annual growth rings and also maybe just said something about time, the spiral move, moving out. It's almost like a, a, a spiral galaxy or something rather, moving its way to the outside. My encounter with this Parsons tree led me to a little bit of study about who th these people, the Puritans were, who came here to New England, Massachusetts, to create this idealized society and there's something that kind of that I find kind of creepy about that although that might have been my interest as a as a fresh out of college guy okay we're gonna go off and we're gonna create a new society here we're, we're gonna reject what uh, the negative things that we perceived in in American society at that point there was this huge wave of people coming from England 20,000 people and overwhelming uh, uh, native people who lived here. Uh, and they had this, the, an attitude about, uh, that I can only perceive as self-righteous. And if you didn't conform to that, bad things happened to you. Uh, like Roger Williams was exiled and uh, other people were accused of witchcraft. So there's something kind of, less than savory about that to our thoughts today, or certainly mine. The land where the Parsons homestead stands, the 1719 home, was actually Joseph and Mary Parsons' homestead land as well. They were among the settlers and founders of the town of Northampton. So 324 years after I moved here, not having any idea that I had any connection with this at all. So with that in mind, I thought, I gotta get some of this wood. My concept for this table was quite different from other things that I've built. It doesn't have an obvious pictographic uh, image. It is marquetry, but maybe not recognizable marquetry to most people. It's, it's simply uh, interesting looking wood piece together to not create an image, but to create a design of sorts. And 
that's different for me on a number of levels. And, and I, I kind of enjoyed that process of making something without, without a picture. I had to think about the design of the table itself and particularly the legs. I wanted to make the whole thing out of this Parsons maple. And frankly, I didn't have that much wood. So I had to think, okay, how am I gonna be able to make a leg that is interesting design and worthy of holding up this structure? So I came up with this wishbone concept and, and put a black line around the whole thing. So that was important for me to tie in with the black spiral line. Ultimately, I, I was quite pleased with the design. I'm, I'm happy with the way it looks and the feel and the function of, of the piece. We live in a world now where a writing table isn't an obvious thing anymore, but a place to put your laptop computer is certainly doable. I've been doing this marquetry thing for pushing on toward 50 years now. I did a video on, on the technique and I wrote a book that people have told me has been inspiring. So uh, obviously that is gratifying. To feel like I've made a difference for the field and for individual people out there who are enjoying what they're making. I would like to think that if I've got a legacy within the furniture woodcraft world, then it will be people are going to pick up the ball and say, I can do that. I'm gratified that I have work in public collections and museums around the country. And some young 20 year old is going to go in and say, I want to try and do that. I want to learn how to do that. That would be the happiest of outcomes. Down the road, uh, people are still going to be interested and, and maybe get a kick out of it, get a laugh out of seeing what I've done.